those that have been touched by grief, how do you reconstruct yourself after you lose a leg, after you lose both of your arms, after your heart's ripped off of your chest? These are the feelings that I've had with my mom, with enormous amounts of information inside of me being poured into me by the grief. So I just walked with this experience and I just walked with the unpleasantness of the grief. When you lose your first God, your first home, right? Your mother, that is calling into question all the roles that you play. Everything. So it brings in the what am I and what am I if she doesn't exist? Welcome to Deeply Well, a soft place to land on your journey, a podcast for those that are curious, creative, and ready to expand in higher consciousness and self-care. I'm Debbie Brown. This is where we heal. This is where we become. Welcome back to the show. Today's show is going to be such a good time. I have been looking forward to this all week. <laughs> I have one of my real life nearest and dearest friends, who also happens to be just one of the most brilliant thought leaders, experts, and hearts in this space. Mm. Today's episode is featuring the Saudi Simone, a spiritual revolutionary, mystic, artist, award-winning filmmaker, and the internationally best-selling author of Spiritually Sassy, Eight Radical Steps to Activate Your Innate Superpowers. He is well known for hosting the top rated Spiritually Sassy Show podcast that I've been a guest on and the Big Celebrity Detox on UK Channel 4 and for creating the Somatic Activated Healing Saw Method. Saw's profound expertise is rooted in a decade of experiential Buddhist practice, his extensive retreat experiences in India and Nepal, and his professional training in contemplative psychotherapy. As a kinesthetic learner, Sa has danced into trance state since 2015, developing a deep understanding of the mind-body connection. This kinesthetic learning process inspired the formulation of his unique and critically acclaimed somatic activated healing method. His trauma-informed approach is informed by his grassroots work in orphanages, homeless shelters, and rehab centers in Indonesia, Nepal, India, and here in the U.S. Saw provides support to the patients of Cedar sinai Hospital as a member of the Spiritual Care Chaplain intern team. Saw's remarkable contributions to homeless youth in Venice Beach earn him the Care Award from the city and county of Los Angeles. He is also a guest teacher at Columbia University. Despite his impressive professional journey and achievements, what truly defines Sa is his courage and resilience. From a young age, his life has been marked by battles with depression, anxiety, and addiction. Yet his unwavering will to keep living and helping others truly signifies his luminary impact in the fields of spirituality and trauma healing. Welcome to the show, my friend. Oh my goodness. I feel <laughs> like um, we, we should all ask someone that we love to read our bios. Because mm. I was just sitting here. I'm like, damn, it sounds different when mm. Davy Brown reads it. Oh, the Davy Brown. The Davy Brown. The one that lives in my heart. Like it's just, it was like a motherly energy. Affirmed mm. and celebrated. It was like life giving to hear you read my bio. Sometimes I feel so awkward you know, hearing it before coming to stage or a podcast and hearing you today was like, ah, oh, that should be a practice mm. that we offer each other as, as good friends, you know? How absolutely beautiful. And just like your observation and your noticing of that is really special to me. Um, I feel really seen in terms of a professional and a person and a heart because when I read bios, 
we should be having reverence for the people that we have on our shows. We should be having reverence for the people in front of us, especially if we are given insight into their lives. And also your life is so beautiful Mm -hmm. and so impactful and it should be spoken to in that way. And I know for myself, and I just have to say, everybody listening, your girl got another cold from her five-year-old. So sorry, (laughs) my voice is going to (laughs) sound very in and out this whole episode, but You know, one of the things that is interesting to me when I go on shows, and I want to preface this by saying, like, I know podcasting absolutely is a massive, massive industry. And for a lot of people, it's just kind of what you do and for work. And so you go in, you go out, you get it done, you go. But I will say something that is a challenge for me when I go on other shows that kind of just have people come in and out, in and out, in and out, and don't get to aren't necessarily connected to the person in front of them is they, they just read through like your lived experience without retaining any of what they're saying. And they read through it just like it's like a magazine, you Mm -hmm. know? And it's like, wait a minute, if we're going to talk about like your work, if we're going to talk about your life's work, if we're going to talk about this incredible offering that we'll be sharing, which is your new book, Spiritually We, I need people to understand who and why you are. (laughs) And that's a big part of it. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you. I'm so excited to have you here. So you, I mean, I, I, I have a lot of reverence for pretty much every single guest that comes on this show, but you and I have a very special friendship that I treasure so deeply. You know, you share yourself really fully. Like you really give people this deep look at the way you live your teachings by the way that you share. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious for those listening, like if you would just share, where are you in this moment and your spiritual experience and what does the walk feel like for you right now? You caught me on that monthly existential crisis days. Mm -hmm. So I'm there. It's like it has a halo and I'm, I mean, they, they two of it. It started yesterday while like the the morning of me doing my book launch at Barnes and Noble at the Grove, uh, having to be like present in front of the audience, friends, fans, it was like an amazing thing. And I was very honest about the fact that I'm in that monthly reoccurring um, experience where I just, for like three days out of every month, I question everything I'm doing. I question myself, I question the path. And then the, where I bounce to is like, okay, I'm done. I think I'm just gonna move back to India and shave my head and become a monk. This is my scape route, is always leaning toward, towards that. So today I'm in that space where I love my life and I love the work I'm doing and I love my friends here. And I'm in that day yeah. two of it where I'm like, mm, what the fuck is the point? My mom is dead. What is, what is the gig? What is this human gig that mothers die? You know? Uh, so I'm there. And yeah. also... I'm also here and just so grateful Mm. to be sitting across you, launching this amazing book that I'm so fucking proud of. I feel like I, um, I feel like I qualify to write this book Mm. because through the hardships that I've gone through in my life, I was taking care of Mm. the breakup, um, pandemic, mother dying, three really hard things. And each of these experiences, I had people not only uh, to pick me up, but to inspire me. Yeah. You know, that's when I knew I was like, okay, cool. So this book is not just concept. It's not me just wanting to learn about a topic, wanting to speak about a topic. It wasn't like an exploration. It was like, I do have these friendships that people want to have. I got them. And it wasn't easy. It wasn't my default, but I arrived there. You yeah. Know. Yeah. I want to I want to ask a question about the first thing that you shared and I think that this could be really expansive for a lot of listeners to lean into but you know that so many of us I Do think, you go through that like on a monthly basis? This is existential sort of paralysis. Oh, your girl lives in existential crisis. Ooh! Yeah. Well, you Ooh! know, my entire life, like my entire life 100% absolutely. <sighs> I, I'm always someone who I, I look at my life as this. 
I committed to being here. I committed to being alive on earth. I'm going to stay and I'm going to do the work that's required and I'm going to feel all of it. And I'm also going to get the joy and the beauty of this very unique experience of being alive on earth with spiritual curriculum. And this place is incredibly challenging to live. You know, like earth is not easy. And I think this is something you and I specifically talk to a lot. And I talk to a lot on this show, but I believe in, in dancing with grief and joy. And so I also have an extremely large capacity for discomfort and gratefully through my practices, I can now move myself into the role of being the observer, the silent witness of a lot of that, those existential days, those days when you wonder how humanity can operate like this, or you, you know, think about the totality of your life's experiences and the weight that that actually takes on you Mm -hmm. mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, And so I think very gratefully the way God designed me I can exist in both at the same time. I can have enthusiasm mm. for my life and I can also see it really clearly and and have experiences of depression and enthusiasm at once, um, which is sometimes very strange. But I honor the way I'm designed and I try to lean into it. And then, you know, I like to have conversations with people like you. Me and you will sit on the floor for hours Mm -hmm. or sit outside of Mm Air One for hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, go in. But that piece that you're speaking to, that we're speaking to now, right? Like so many people, because I, I tend to think, and I don't want to, you know, make this a monolith or overly generalize, but if you're on this path of kind of being the wounded healer, if you're on this path of finding expertise to share with others through your own embodiment and healing of yourself, mm-hmm. which so many that listen to the show are, you that that's part of your life. This this kind of bizarre pull of wanting to serve and then wanting to disappear and not be perceived or just be in your devotion privately. I definitely um I don't want to say struggle with that because it's not a struggle. This is life. But I definitely am always in observation of that within myself. Like I want to serve. I want to be on the ground floor. I do. And then I need a lot of time Mm -hmm. to not be around anyone that Mm -hmm. is not in like my deepest, most intimate inner circle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I find it challenging to post pictures on social media because – I don't want to be seen. <laughs> I don't want to be perceived all the time. I mm-hmm. want to live my life. Mm-hmm. I want to do my good work. I want to mm-hmm. love. Um, and I don't want to always have to make it available to be consumed. So that's like my personal, you know, way that I relate. But Amen. how Same. does, yeah. when you say like, you know, and you especially, my goodness, you have, and I, I know people that follow you know this, but I'm certain that people that maybe just catch a quick bite of you could never fully understand how devotional you are, Mm. how deeply, authentically you are connected to the spiritual path, to the ancientness of the spiritual Mm -hmm. path. So you are someone that will disappear for months and be in India just meditating, Mm -hmm. just praying. Mm -hmm. You went on a 500-mile walk with your father, Mm -hmm. a pilgrimage after your mother a grief God walk. bless. Yeah. Pass. You went on that grief walk. And mm-hmm. those are the kinds of things that like change you at a cellular level, that that change you in a way that, you know, like a self-help book could never, you know. <laughs> and that so it's part. like that part. That path. Yeah. So when I heard you say something earlier as, you know, you want to take robes, you want to shave your head, and you just want to be in that path, but then you also live a very large mm-hmm. life here. What does that feel like to you? What inside says, I want this right now. Mm-hmm. I don't want this. Mm-hmm. Tammy Simon, the founder of Sounds True, said something so beautiful while I was in her show the other day. She says, God has me in a really tight leash. And I found it so profound because I feel the same. I feel like the unseen beings, the deities, the gods and goddesses, the unseen forces have me in a really tight leash. Anytime I want to disappear, I am 
pulled back, you know, jolted back, dragged back to service. And tell and me about the feeling of wanting to disappear, though. What what it's not that... a suicidal ideation. No, no, no. I'm way beyond that. This is like 10 years in, in resolution. No, but I mean, what a life as a monk, mm. what is the feeling that you long for in that? Like, what is what mm -hmm. is the soothingness of that or the delight of that? Yeah. Thank you for that. It is that. It's just having your every day be about devotion. Yeah. Your every moment be in connection to the unseen forces. Your every moment praying for the well-being of others. Your every moment mm. is in devotion to the tapestry that is unseen by the eyes but felt by the spirit, you know? Yeah. Working on that plane. You know, my therapist reminds me often, she's like, Saad, there's there are people in caves in Nepal and in India right now praying for your well-being that you will never meet. Mm -hmm. These saints are right now reaching the highest of the highs, peaks of nirvana and samadhi states, and they're praying for your well-being. And you to them is a total stranger and you will never meet them, but they're actively working for your benefit. Mm -hmm. And there's something so beautiful around that for me that's like, how would I, what would happen to me if I fully devoted my life yeah. to this sort of 24 hour um, cycle of, of devotion? Because as much as we want to become nobody, right? Because that's the path of, of spirituality, to dissolve yes. preferences, to dissolve personality, to really merge with the other, to lose the boundaries of where I end and where you begin, to really arrive at that plane. However, because we live in a city like Los Angeles, um, so many things um, lead the way for us, create prejudice in people's minds, create biases on people's minds, create stories in people's minds about who we are. And yeah. we unconsciously follow through their biases, follow through their prejudice, follow through their stories. Does that make sense? Yes. We unconsciously resur resurrect old versions of ourselves to entertain other people yeah. because we're master people pleasers. So. I believe that if you remove the veil of the super intense matrix of a city like Los Angeles, you know, and you are in a Himalayan monastery, I believe that some of the hardship that I go through to dissolve my somebodyness, to dissolve my specialness, to dissolve my uniqueness, I would reach that state yeah. faster, sooner. However, I say all this with grace because this new book is a critical analysis of that. Mm -hmm. It's saying that you got to walk off the monastery into the streets. It's saying you have to leave the cave and you have to go to the city because this is where the work lies. It's mm -hmm. freedom is relational. Yes, there's, there's very specific paths to freedom that are in the isolated mountaintop and they're very celebrated and they're there. However, some say that that path may take longer than you actually doing this work in relationship. So mm. the book is a call to that, calling us back into relationship, calling us back into friendship, calling us back into community that the way to st stabilize our freedom, to develop our presence, to develop our forgiveness, to develop our, our patience, it's in relationship. It's one thing for you to be kind to yourself in the morning, by yourself in your altar and in the protection of our house. It's another thing to really develop our patience when we are dealing with someone who's annoying, you know? Yeah, it, it's, it, I love that because that, it's why we're here, you know, God That's right. teaches through relationship and relationship with people, with things, with places, with yeah. animals, but that is how we have our human experience That's by right. interacting with humanity. Yeah. When this book came in for you, talk to me about that because you wrote this book in the midst of a lot. Insane, insane. I think I think the I stood in front of the the of the audience yesterday at Barnes and Noble last night, and I said, the fact that I finished this book, even if the book is crap, which I know it's not, thank God, um, is already a huge accomplishment because I wrote it through the grief of a breakup and the insane, disorienting, suffocating grief of losing my mother, and the fact that I finished it uh, and turned it in. And I edited the fucking shit, excuse my language. I edited the shit out of the book after the grief of losing my mom touched my body. 
from having that experience, like take over my body, my mind, my spirit, my heart, I edited so much out of the book. The profundity and the depth of what's in the book completely changed because I had never experienced that kind of loss. I had helped students grieve. I had helped other people. I had been uh, a support to other people. But it's one thing for you to be a support to someone who's going through. It's another thing for you to be touched by grief in this way. And there, in, in the world today, I see, this is my, when I get to be uh, reductionistic sometimes, I get to be limited in my vocabulary. I believe that there are those who have been touched by grief and, the, and those who have not yet. And those that have been touched by grief, they, if they are allowed themselves to immerse themselves in grief, if they're not doing the booked and busy capitalistic agenda, which is I have to, unfortunately, a lot of people don't even have the choice to fall apart because yeah. of the societal, Absolutely. corporate. You get two days of bereavement. That's right. And then yeah. you're back to work. My mother died. Okay, see you on, see you on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, you take the day off. See you on Wednesday, you know, and then you, you have to perform. So you... Our society doesn't allow us to fall apart. Our society doesn't build into its infrastructure time for how do you reconstruct yourself after you lose a leg, after yeah. you lose both of your arms, after your heart's ripped off of your chest. These are the feelings that I've had with my mom. For the first three months, Devi, I had no short-term memory. Like I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast at lunch. I couldn't tell you what I had for breakfast at lunch. And that is, if you look at grief brain, it's a common thing. But why are we talking about it? Because the vast majority of people don't have the time to even name that. Or guess what? They tell that to someone and someone, someone, someone pathologizes them immediately and they become over-medicated. I yeah. had depersonalization, derealization. I felt my, my reality was a dream. I felt like I was watching Sa live his life. I was outside of my body. These experiences are not part of the vernacular because we're so scared of naming that I lost my mind after my mother died. And because I am an explorer of the human psyche, of the human body, you know, the, the word mystic, I'm proud to, to, to use this word as a description to my experience because I'm not, I'm not seeking, I'm not reading and performing what I've read. A mystic is someone who seeks realization by lived experience. Mm. And because my, my lived experience is my Bible, you know, of course I follow a very strict Buddhist path, then you can, you can call yourself a mystic. Because what I've went through and so honestly shared with the world was that I fell apart. And I, I've, I've been slowly rebuilding myself, you know. So tying back to the book, it's, the, the pages of the book have all been touched by that grief, by that depth, by that loss, that intensity, that disorienting, inevitable experience that all of us will be touched by. And then, of course, you have people in the world today, multi, multi millionaires who are uh, wanting to defy the odds and to live forever and, and to not die. And I think we're missing the novelty and the beauty of having an expiration date, you know? I think you lose poetry and you, you, your, your boredom mm. that's already deemed as something bad becomes pervasive and you could then become even more selfish because yeah. it's how can I live forever? You know? Oh my God, right as you were talking, I thought of I this. went I fucking went everywhere. I don't know if I got I mean, your answer, as, but as there. As we do, yeah. the, the correct answer will emerge every time. Um, Amen, sis. You're as right. you were talking, I was remembering this scene. I so agree with you on that. Like, I, I want to live so fully. Um, I hope I'm blessed to become an ancient elder. You know, I really want, I love observing humanity. So I would love to be very healthy, mobile, over 100, and able to share wisdom and see, you know, what Earth has become. So knock on all the woods. I see that for you, long gray hair, yes, like Quest is a full grown Ooh. adult no, with a I family. And I mean, I like yeah. fantasize about being like an elder because I want to be a a hot, healthy elder. So I just love seeing like women who are still themselves 
in their bodies, um, in their femininity, because that's what I relate to, and like long, flowy gray hair, but like gorgeous in you know decked out in their meaningful pieces, yeah. and like oh, I'm here for it, I'm so mm-hmm, here for it, flexible, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm, yes, mm-hmm. but <laughs> amen, I'm there, and I'm I'm literally walking right next to you with my little walker, or hopefully I don't even need a walker, you know? What <laughs> You'll I mean? be dancing next. That's to me. right. That's right. But there there was this scene in the movie Noah. I don't know if you've ever seen that. It was I believe oh. Ridley Scott directed it. Uh, God, I hope that's who did it. Uh, came out like over ten years ago. Okay. I re- watched it in the last couple of years because I love um, studying the book of Enoch and the history Noah to Methuselah to Enoch and Methuselah was in the Bible I believe the oldest person that ever lived oh wow so he was I'm gonna get this so wrong y'all but I think hundreds and hundreds of years old I don't know the exact number but there's a scene in Noah where the great flood is coming right where creation is being restarted and you see Methuselah in in this small little cave, this little mossy patch, and he hears the water coming, right? This is like I- extinction. This is the great melt. So this is like the glacial ice lake and the rains. And- yeah, shit's about to go down. And in the scene right before the water hits him, he like licks his lips like it's delicious and smiles and is kind of like... <sighs> like he's just so ready Who for plays sweet Noah? death. Uh, Russell Crowe plays Noah and Ooh. Anthony Hopkins is Methuselah, which Ooh. come on. Mm. But that to scene to me was so invocative. Like it was just so striking to see someone leap towards death because their work was complete, that they were longing to have the next experience. What yeah. else? Yeah. What yeah. next? Yeah. You know, and so it just that what you said resonates with me deeply because I think that's such a powerful way to look at our human experience. Like everyone, as you mentioned, is gripping and trying to hold and keep things comfortably the same. And it's like, let life change you. Let it change you. How let the things that happen to you change yeah. you. Yeah. And then live fully because when it's your time, I want to go out with that kind of like expectant smile of more, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as you're writing... Can I name something about this before you ask this question? Please. I experienced something so profound at my mother's funeral, which was, I don't know if she was ready to go, but I was coming from Indonesia. My sister was coming from Nepal. My mom was in an induced coma and she stayed for two hours and then she died. So she waited for us to arrive from these far away countries to die. And the reason why I'm naming this is because a lot of us are not thinking about our eulogy. Mm. We're not thinking about the fact that how we live will dictate the, the, our experience as we die. Right. We're not really thinking about how every moment, every person, every time we, we can lift the space. We can, you know, bring a smile to someone's face. We can help someone. We can just do the, the smaller, big ways, right? That we can lift the world, that we can lift each other, that we can inspire yeah. each other. It all adds up to how your death will be, peaceful or chaotic. And in Buddhism, we're really training ourselves for that moment. A lot mm. of it, it's like, it's either you become enlightened um, why you're still alive and that's a really hard path, but that's part of the part of the training. Or you work yourself to become so lucid and you have accumulated so many good deeds. You've become you've become you've lived such an exper- uh, inspire inspirational life that your moment of death is a peaceful one. And the reason why I'm saying all this to wrap wow. this to give a little bit more context, my mother's funeral was a really eye-opening experience to how I want to be remembered. Even though most of us are only remembered for like five, 10 years, except for your close family. Most people will, most people, 99.9% of us will all be forgotten within a couple of years or five, 10 years. It's, this is the max, right? Even the biggest superstars are forgotten. Only like 10 every hundred years are really remembered, right? Like, Think about that, everyone. Like this, when everyone is thinking about posting stuff or just legacy in terms of social media impact, like 
even in bigger legacy, like ultimately it can't be about vanity because maybe every hundred years as a whole, 50 people are remembered globally. <laughs> That's right. Globally. Yeah. That's like so, you, we, we have to bask in the sweetness of being forgotten. We have to like oh God, really just Ooh. like, oh, how delicious that oh. I get to be fully forgotten and not be scared of it. Oh. I think we we hold on to to a legacy of of not making mistakes, a legacy of harmony and sweetness and accumulation for a lot of people. Yes. Instead of instead of living out loud and making mistakes and and being hurt and 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 breaking your heart and and breaking hearts, all of it for the sake of living a full human life. And then not forgetting the precious moment of you, you know, laying there lifeless and your family members walking up. And I'm, now I'm talking up a little bit. And your family members walking up to, to tell stories about how you mm -hmm. lived and friends walking up and telling stories about how you touched their lives. My mother's funeral was a big inspirational point for me. Mm. Because one may say she lived a very simple life. She wasn't a popular person by social media standards, right? Uh, well, that's not entirely true because her and I have had viral videos of us dancing as she had just gone through chemotherapy. And enough viral videos that it got the attention of Deepak Chopra's team. And that's how I ended up going to teach alongside mm. Deepak and leading the SA method on Instagram for the, you know, most of the pandemic. Um, but my mother's funeral was a, such a spectacular reminder of how I want to be remembered. Yeah. As wow. someone who, who touched people in beautiful and sweet and simple ways, you know, it was really about her presence, presence. It was really about her smile. It was really about her warmth, you know? And not she these had big such acts. such a beautiful warmth. She really such did. A, like I remember yeah. she FaceTimed with you and she was talking to Quest over FaceTime. Yes. And she was just this like, oh my God, like a sun, like, yeah. a, like a beam yeah. of light coming yeah. through your phone. And you know, the last phone call I had with her, I asked my astrologer, who we both share. Um, Daryl. Daryl. I asked Daryl about my mother's chart. And he said... This is the last phone call I had with her before she died. I asked, can you read her chart for me? Um, or what's going on for her? What is the season that she's in, you know? And he said many things, but the important thing was is that she had the, star, the, the chart of a star. She was meant to be popular. She was meant to be seen in a global stage. And I remember telling her this as she was already in the hospital. And she was hospitalized for pneumonia, which was misdiagnosis of a problem she was having because of radiation to her brain. Um, yeah. So this was the last phone call I had with her. Wow. What was the experience after your mom passed? You did your 500 mile mm -hmm. walk of grief. Mm -hmm. Insane. Insane. What is an experience? I, I don't even know how to formulate the question because it's like yeah. a thousand questions in one. But mm -hmm. one, what led you to that? How did you know that was the path you needed mm -hmm. for your growth, for your grief? And That's then enough of a question. On a day-to-day -day yeah. experience, yeah. Like, how did that feel? Mm -hmm. How how were you in process with her throughout that walk? Because mm -hmm. that is... You're walking for 500 miles, so a mm -hmm. full day. 32 days for 32 about seven days. hours a day. Mm -hmm. Seven hours a day. Mm -hmm. My God. Three hours in the morning, four hours in the afternoon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Insane. Wow. Okay, so why did I do it? What happened? So mom died December 25th of 2022. January, February, March, I was in complete disenchantment with humanity. Simultaneously, I had my training started. So I was training 100 people in how to be somatic activated healers. Mm. So I had to immediately lock in a part of me and deliver this training to these people who had paid good money 
to, to learn this method and to teach this method, right? And looking back, that was a life-affirming choice. That was a life-giving choice because it anchored me in service. It anchored me here. Yeah. And then a few months, like Janeiro, Fevereiro, Mars, and then April came around and I remember feeling desensitized of to my grief. I remember questioning, did my mom ever live? Did she ever love me? And have I... Did I even have a life with her? I was so desensitized and I was and I was losing sight of the grief to such a degree that I started to question if I even have had a mother. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's on the verge of a little like insanity a little bit. But that's what grief can can catapult you towards, you know? And I said, and, and I what need I'm hearing what you're yeah. saying is especially in a role like that of and you the two of you had such a beautiful relationship. That's so true. much love yeah. filled the room when the two of you were together. So yeah. that was such a blessed experience yeah. to have with yeah. a mother. But what I'm hearing is too, when you lose your first God, your first home, right? Your mother, that is calling into question all the roles that you play. Everything. So it brings in the, what am I? And what am I if she doesn't exist? Exactly. All of it, literally all of that. It was, and the, it became such a, it was so heavy to carry the idea, and it still is, of living through life without that anchor, without that figure yeah. in my life, you know? So all of this to say that I started to be desensitized to the grief and I started to take on more work, do more things. And I was like, mm, this is not, I, I think I'm I think I've lost the plot. Like I should not mm. be high performance sat right now. Something is off. And that's when I realized that what was off was not enough space for the grief to emerge. Not enough space for the grief to to break me down. Not enough time to fall apart. And fall apart so gracefully that no one who, her, who would hear me, my mother just died, would <gasps> flinch or say, I'm so sorry for your lost thoughts and prayer, or they would do the immediate thing. Uh, she's in a better place. Mm -hmm. She's your ancestor oh, now. Goodness. She has yeah. angel wings now. She's watching over you. At least she's not in pain. You know, all the oh. well-intended things that we say during grief, which are tremendously hurtful. It's for that person's comfort. Exactly, yeah. because, because they're so deeply uncomfortable with how you are feeling that they want to name something, say something yeah. that in their mind could potentially resolve or fix you out of suffering <laughs> so they feel better right. without understanding that suffering ceases and passes and changes with presence. So I needed a concerted amount of time to fall apart and to fall apart in such a graceful yeah. way that I wouldn't have anyone, even the well-intended friends and community uh, and strangers, because so many people who follow my work run into fans all the time and they would always want to say something so sweet and so kind. Um, and it would always like tug at me, um, at my experience with the grief. So going on this walk yeah. was the specific amount of time I didn't know that 32 days was gonna I was gonna be the perfect amount of time to be honest. I just knew I needed to walk with the grief. I knew that walking does so well for me as a as a meditative practice, as a as a spiritual practice, as a as an opportunity to just be with a feeling, be with an experience. And I had downloaded all these playlists and these podcasts and these books that I wanted to listen to, and I really realized that I was saturated with enormous amounts of information inside of me that I didn't need to add music. I didn't need to add a podcast. I didn't need to add a book in order for me to distract myself from the overload of information that was being poured into me by the grief. So I just walked with Ugh. this experience and I just walked with the unpleasantness of the grief. And at some point, I started to really make friends with the with, with grief that, hey, this is a friend that, that will be with me for the rest of my life. Because I think the I think Anne Lamott says it's like you you start to limp 
and you just realize that the limp is part of your new way of walking. And I find that so reassuring and so, um, so beautiful because, you know, I did lose a part of me. Mm -hmm. And how do I live without a part of myself, you know? So this is what living with grief teaches me. And that's what the walk emphasized. It's like, I needed this amount of time to bond with my dad, to give my dad an opportunity to become my dad again, you know, wow. to reposition him back on that altar as the father who is now lost his love of 42 years. This man is trying to become wow. a new person after having lived side by side with this woman for 42 years. Oh it's like he's lived more with her than with anyone else. You know, yeah. he's, his personality is more built, entrenched with her than of, with him by himself. You know, it's that severe. So we, all of this came to fruition. All of this was like part of the walk. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of self-editing, a lot of self-transformation, uh, and also a lot of relational experience because I had never spent this amount of time with my father before because mom was always the anchor in the family. We would always, dad always knew what was going on for us through mom because mom was the one who talked on the phone morning and night. We would check in and we would, you know, come to her with the good and the bad, uh, everything, all the experience. And then dad would find out through her. Now, dad was not taking her space, but now having learned how to hold not the success Sa is going through, not the, the other celebrity that Sa is working with, none of that. But who is Sa grieving the loss of his beloved mother? Mm. You know, can my dad handle me sobbing over my soup at lunch? Can my dad hold me at dinner when I wake up in a panic? because I'm remembering, I'm having flashbacks of my mom at the hospital, you know, can he handle that? And time after time, he proved himself, not that he needed to, but he proved that he can love me beyond, mm -hmm. in, in, ways be, in ways that go beyond my imagination. They, they're not, I love you ways, the words don't come out, but it's nonverbal. They're just the warmth of his presence, you know, or acts. He would then buy me breakfast. He would have breakfast ordered to the table mm. before I arrived. He would, I would arrive at, at the lunch spot, the only lunch spot in the middle of the walk. He would have lunch ordered to the table, you know. So these acts of service meant a lot. It really transformed our relationship. It really showed me that he knows how to love me in ways that I actually, uh, that ways that I actually need. You know, how special! My God, how powerful! Ugh. everything that you just shared. I mean, one, it, it, there's just so many layers to the power of it. Um, and I know we have listeners that are probably teared up right now, connecting to this, but. <sighs> The, in this experience and what you mm -hmm. just shared, like there's so many layers of access to spirit that everyone listening can dive into. You know, it's like because I heard so many things I heard about the grief. I heard about the glory of the beauty of the relationship you had with this special, special woman and mother. Mm -hmm. I heard about some of the ways that you were even challenging yourself with the grief, right? And that especially I think is so profound because depression is guaranteed. Depression is guaranteed. First of all, I mm. want to normalize mm. depression. To be alive, depression is guaranteed. That is my belief. I have never met a single person, nor do I imagine I would if they're being fully honest, that has not experienced some level of depression, at least by the end of their life, right? If not once a week, once a month, you know, um, or however often. But grief doesn't just, I think we we miss tremendous opportunity if we just keep our thoughts of grief about depression. What I heard was a way that you allowed grief to help you rise. You allowed your grief to transform so many different particle pieces of you. And it's like even the awareness that has led to this book, you were describing that awareness funneling in 
through the dynamic of your father and through recognizing some areas where you weren't as close Mm -hmm. and now a new invitation to know each other in a new way and to be close in a new way, to even make the choice, my God, as an offering to the vastness of your love for your mother and her love for you, Mm -hmm. to spend 32 days walking with the grief as your companion, literally. Yep. And we're about to do another one. We're about to do another one. We're thinking about going to the Oregon Coast Trail. So this one is, Ah. I think it's 392 miles. So close to 400 miles. And it will take us, we'll do in the same amount, maybe like 27 to 30 days. We're deciding if we're going to do this one or or one in Japan. It's, It's our yearly way of memorializing mom and never losing sight of the grief and never losing sight of of her presence in our lives because it could we can so quickly become busy we can so quickly lose yeah. the the connection to the severity of what it means to lose a mother and the profundity of what it means to have another day on earth the poetry of sitting after you sobbed to the point of snot coming down your nose and you are sitting on a trail and you look up and I can fucking cry thinking of it and you see the leaves dancing in the wind Mm. and you feel the sun kissing your skin and you come alive again. You realize I am in this body. I get to live. I get to continue to walk for her. For everyone who didn't have the chance. I get to feel the grief of the world. For all those who don't have the time and the privilege and the energy to go into this place. I get to grieve for those who don't have the time. I get to be a a pillar of light in a dark space for people. And I get to go to the depth of it in such a way because no one on that trail is trying to fix or resolve me. And I have a story to tell about this. I had a, I had a person that I, I had seen on the trail. Sometimes if you're, if you're consistent about the time you wake up and the time that you, um, the time that you go, the time that you wake up every day and the time that you, it really has to do with when you wake up. If you ended up seeing the same people on the trail, right? Mm. Some, maybe you walk with some people for like three, four days and maybe someone takes a rest day. So when you wake up and when you take your rest day, it really dictates if you walk with a group of people. Maybe these are five to ten people that you see at the same hotel or hostel or cafes or mm. restaurants, right? Through the trail. And there was this person, this woman who I, would, I was seeing and I had all this judgment towards her. I had this like wave of biases, wave of prejudice, just washing over me and cluttering my view of this person without even meeting her, without ever having spent a single moment in her presence Mm -hmm. or or even knowing her name. Okay, I'm I'm in day three of the trail, day four of the trail. The grief hasn't kicked in. I'm kind of like, okay, cool. I'm putting I'm putting music on. Music that the songs that remind me of my mother to see if it was kickstart the the tsunami effect, still just a little bit here and there, and then I'm walking on an average trail through the forest, nothing like mind blowing, nothing like you know, and something just like a wave of grief starts to pour in, and I unearth this ungrieved grief, and I start to sob and sob and wail to the point that I even lose uh, balance. So I sit on the trail. Who is the person who comes from behind me and hands me a tissue with a hand on my shoulder? That woman. Mm. And she didn't say a single thing for a whole like maybe five, ten minutes that felt like eternity. She just stood there with a hand on my shoulder. So the wow. warmth of her hand allowed me co- to continue to unveil this grief, to continue to unveil the sadness, to continue to unveil this beautiful space for me without trying to fix me, without trying to resolve me or urge me out of the tunnel of darkness, you know? Yeah. She just stood there. And then we didn't even exchange names at that point. It wasn't until a couple of days later that I ran into her at a cafe one of the, you know, sporadic stops through the trail where there's a cafe in the middle of the forest, in the middle of the, you know, on the side of a road or something. Um, 
that I was able to just say, hey, thank you so much mm. for that. That was really meaningful to me. Um, yeah. So we never know who who will be the messenger of of grace that can be a reminder for us to feel our grief, to not be desensitized by it. And never to think that grief is too big of an emotion that you can't hold. Yeah. You know, never to think that any feeling is too big, that they're here to hurt you or that they're here in a way that will engulf you and take you out. What takes us out is our relationship to our feelings. You know, mm. it really did the number that I never thought a walk of that magnitude could really like transform my relationship to grief and to remind me to keep going, mm. to keep living, you know, that grief is a reminder of paradox. Grief is a reminder to live in paradox. You, you spoke about this way earlier about can I be depressed and inspired? Can I be grieving and grateful? You know, as Mark Nepo says, the poet, he says, everything is beautiful and I'm so sad. Mm. That's my, my state, yeah. you know, and I'm okay. Yeah. And that's okay. Because that's what it means to live a full, a full human life is to not have boundaries or to reject the transient nature of life, which means if change is inevitable, then grief is inevitable because everything's changing. So everything, you know, is in movement. So the old version of ourselves, the, every single experience will never happen again. And because yeah. of it, grief is weaved into that tapestry and I won't shy away from it. I'm now driven by, by it to open myself up to the beauty in that, you know. Sa's latest book, Spiritually We, The Art of Relating and Connecting from the Heart, is available now. Um, this is such a special, introspective, and incredibly applicable book to really start repositioning people in your life and also challenge yourself to the boundaries you hold for people. Are they mm -hmm. healthy, safe boundaries or are they boundaries that keep you engaged and your experience that keep you avoiding yourself? And it's just so important to dive into that. So this book is absolutely such a beautiful companion for you at this juncture of your journey. So how can everyone connect with you and continue to connect with your powerful work? I would love for people to get the book, Spiritually We, because it's we're living through a loneliness epidemic you know, more people are lonely than connected. That's just the statistics, you know? Yeah. So I, I would love for people to get the book. And also if they want to, you know, shake and dance and scream in a safe, intentional environment, come to the somatic dance floor, come mm. to the somatic activated healing membership, but do both, you know, like come and dance. But really this is, this is the biggest offering because I yeah. think we've lost the plot in how to relate. I think we've, we have gone so far away from learning and actually in knowing that relationship and friendship is a biological, psychological, spiritual nutrient that we can't live without. Yes. And through the research in the book, I really found out that like loneliness strikes in the body like hunger. It's a cue for something that you need, for something that you're lacking. And this is what the research has to show. And we're not taught that. We're not trained in that. We're not educated in that. We are you know, in a capitalistic society. Um, and I'm not an anti-capitalist person. I believe there's good things from it as well. But I think the, the way how pervasive it is of the yeah. zero-sum game, of this competition, of this um, overachieving, this do more. And the more you do, the better you feel kind of mindset, right? and how much our self-worth is based on what we have to show for it. These aspects of this culture are the toxic traits that yeah. I want us to erase, delete, unsubscribe from. So the book really addresses this vital need that we need each other, that we can't do the human gig alone. It's impossible to do human by yourself. You can't carry the burden but alone. It's impossible. And your joy is multiplied in community. And also, if you're on a spiritual path, the relationships 
will show you how free you are. Because mm-hmm. it's one thing to be free in your cushion by yourself mm-hmm. at home. <laughs> then when you bring it, that freedom to the coffee shop, to your mother-in-law, to your ex-husband, to your ex-boyfriend, to whatever. Yeah. Are you really free or can you just talk the talk? Because you're free if you're free in front of those who annoy you, who trigger you, who've hurt you. That's when you know that you're free. So the book is a call to that. Absolutely. You know, and it's a big call to remind us that, hey, so many people in America are experiencing really hard times in their lives by themselves because they're so profoundly distracted. The phone that was here, that is here to connect us, to weave us with the tapestry of, of connection, is actually doing the opposite. It's separating us. It's keeping us away from seeing the poetry and the beauty in human life. 100%. It's, it's pulling us into, into savoring social media more so than connection in person. I think that's one of the biggest pitfalls because I think for a lot of people, they're lonely and they don't understand fully why. And a lot of it is, and this isn't everyone's fault, this is the conditioning of social media. We've spent the last 15 years where people thought just liking someone you know's content or leaving a comment is friendship. And it's not. It's it's connection online. It's, you know, kind of like raising your hand. But that is not the same thing as being in community with people or being in relationship with other people. You have to kind of test it out in real life, too. So mm-hmm. everyone has been getting like nourished by junk food by thinking they're so connected to people. But when it actually comes to them having life experiences, Mm -hmm. their ability to relate, Mm -hmm. um, I think, really goes down. So this book is available in stores right now, Spiritually We. And, of course, Saw has his incredible podcast, his first book, such uh, so many beautiful tools for real embodiment of your process to be who you want to be, not just to speak in theory about who you want to be, to actually live it. So SaudiSimone.com is how you can check out Saab. Of course, his Instagram, at Saudi Simone. Closing thought, I always like to extend a little soul work to everybody listening. What is a practice that those connecting with this episode can take with them for this week? It could be a thought starter. It could be a question of inquiry. I got you. I got you. It's, it's It's something that I speak about in the book called uh, social integration. I want you to say hi to your neighbor. I want you to say hi to the person at the coffee shop. I want you to humanize every human you see, not just see them as a, as a passerby, as someone who doesn't have depth or that doesn't suffer the same ways that you do. I want you to see everyone that you come in contact with, even if you live in a big city, well, maybe if you're walking down New York City and you're, you know, in contact with 100 people on the sidewalk, maybe not, but... Yeah, have um, discernment. Have discernment, that's right, <laughs> yeah. Um, but really try to humanize every human being. Can yeah. you touch their humanity? Can you realize that just like you, they want to be happy and they don't want to suffer? And also, just like you, they do suffer, you know? And their moms may die and their partners may leave them and things like this may happen. So don't gloss over people. Don't see people as a as a hologram without depth and feeling and a whole human experience behind them that they're, you know, living through. Um, humanize everyone you come in contact with and test your material. See if you can offer a genuine compliment to a stranger this week. See if you can say, I like your shoes. Nice hair. You look great. You know, like Test your capacity to engage and see what happens inside of you because it will lift them up. But look at the high that you are uh, creating for yourself. You know, it's a beautiful experience to relate. We've we've lost the plot when it comes to relationships Mm. and we're missing such a beautiful way of uh, of feeling good by by being seen. Beautiful, beautiful. I love you. I love you back. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste, my love. Get your tickets for the Black Effect Podcast Network. Don't forget, um, we're doing the podcast festival 
April 27th. Cannot wait to see you there. I'm doing a live show and I have special guests to announce that are going to be joining me. So Atlanta, April 27th. I cannot wait to see everyone at the Black Effect Podcast Network. Have a beautiful week. Catch you next episode. Namaste.